Good morning. Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I am the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. If you'd like to stop by and visit us, you can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. And you can also reach out to us by phone or email if you would like to get in touch to uh, discuss further one of the topics that we discuss on the program. Or if you would like to request a, a topic for a, a future TV show, you can reach us at 812-550-6234 or at info at riverridgechurch.org. We'd be more than happy to uh, address any questions that you might have, or to discuss things further, or to set up a, a more regular study if you would like to delve into these things a little deeper. You can also check our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash riverridgechurchofchrist. That channel has all of our past TV programs, not to mention our weekly live-streamed worship services, so you can get all of our weekly Bible studies as well as the, the worship services and the lessons that I present during those uh, over the YouTube channel. The times for all of those are Sunday morning at 9 for our Bible class, 10 for our worship period. We also gather at 4 p.m. on Sundays for another period of worship later in the day. And then we have a 7 p.m. Wednesday evening Bible study, too. And we welcome you to join those in person or over the live stream on YouTube anytime that you'd like. Today we are doing another installment in our ongoing series on the New Testament book of Revelation. And particularly, we're thinking about how it matters to us today. Now, if you haven't been following along, or if you don't remember any of those previous installments, then I can't blame you. They've been pretty far between, and in the midst of all the vast body of study that we have been covering on a weekly basis here. But you can always go over to our YouTube channel and find the playlist, I think it's just called Revelation, and then get up to speed pretty easily and pretty quickly to catch up with where we are now. We're actually not going to spend the bulk of our time this morning on the text of Revelation, because today we're talking about something that's more big picture. But our problem is in one specific chunk of that, in chapter 20. Let's read the first 10 verses. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea." And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever. There are different interpretations of all of this, and because humans like to name things, most of these interpretations have a label attached. We've got, broadly, the premillennialist option pre, before, and millennial, well, you can see the thousand years. The idea here with before the thousand year period is that Christ is to return to earth before that thousand year reign. And this is an interpretation I should point out, not only of Revelation, although that's where it comes from here in chapter 20, but it is then used more broadly to interpret the rest of the New Testament as well as the Old. And then there are other views, like the amillennialist, which says that there's not actually going to be a distinct thousand-year period of Christ's reign on earth, or the postmillennialist, which holds that Christ's return to earth, his second coming, you might say, will not occur until after that thousand-year period. Now, within all of these options, there are several different ways to understand our place in the scheme of history and in the story and, and in the symbols that have been presented, particularly here in Revelation 20. I'm not going to necessarily come down on any one of those. 
Instead, I would like to just inform you of them very broadly, and then let's do a, a brief exegesis of this text. Numerical symbols aren't always meant to be exact. Now, if you disagree with that, then you're going to have lots of fun with Daniel and the last few chapters of Ezekiel in particular, as well as the rest of Revelation. For example, let's take a gander at uh, chapter 21, verses 15 and 16. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and its width and height are equal. 12,000 stadia, a perfect cube. I challenge you to try to square that with a literal interpretation of the numbers, as well as the broadly premillennialist view that the current physical earth will be the spatial location of the finally established kingdom of Christ. I expect you'll be a while on that, so I'm going to move on. Also, when John says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection, I think his choice of the present tense is careful and deliberate. Obviously, he's switching back and forth between retelling in the past tense what he saw in his vision, and then saying what it means, which alternates between present and future. Over such, the second death has, present tense, no power, but they will be, future tense, priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign for him for a thousand years. John's not just being careless with his tenses here. The question is whether he's using the present tense because those statements reflect generic truths, or because at the time of his writing, it was already an ongoing process. Since it's a bit odd to suggest that generally when a thousand year period of Christ's reign over the earth occurs, his loyal subjects are typically immune to the second death, I think it's probably that other one. When John wrote, he considered that the first resurrection had already begun, which means it's the spiritual one that occurs when someone becomes a Christian, mimicking Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. And that makes a great deal of sense with the rest of the passage and, indeed, the rest of the book. But not everyone agrees. Hence, we have this argument. This conflict boils down essentially to this. Is the kingdom now or later? And there are some disturbing implications of the broadly premillennialist view, which, which says that the kingdom is later. Essentially, it, it holds that Christ and his father failed the first time around. But rather than rehash the doctrine, for today, I'm interested in the motives behind it. Why is it that some are inclined to interpret Revelation in this way, which, at least to me, seems a little silly? Once they have done this, then they can walk back through the New Testament and sew it all together with a tribulation and a rapture and a man of lawlessness and an antichrist, all referring to, they would say, discrete individuals and events supposed to lie somewhere just around the corner as time marches on. There's a conflict between premillennialism and the rest of the New Testament. Victory is proclaimed in Revelation and elsewhere as as if it has already been accomplished. It doesn't change a whole lot, if anything, of how we should behave day to day, whether or not premillennialism or one of the other doctrines is, is correct or incorrect. It's also not a particularly attractive doctrine to weak individuals, unlike a lot of others. There are some hyper-Calvinistic interpretations that go toward this misguided, licentious mentality of doing whatever I want. Or, for another example, you've got the black Hebrew Israelite nonsense, or the somehow even more absurd white British Israelite nonsense that you may or may not have heard of, but is totally a doctrine with adherence today. I suppose that perhaps some like the idea of getting sort of a second chance during the millennium to come in order to shape up and follow Christ. I mean, not now. I'm not going to do that now, of course. But later, when that happens, you can bet I'll shape up then. They've done a crummy job of doing that so far, but on top of that, you'd have to live long enough to make it to the millennium in order for that to actually transpire for you. Whether you subscribe to the premillennialist view or not, I'm afraid that we all tend to make the same basic mistake, either in this or in other areas of our lives and our walk with God. 
they would hold that Christ's kingdom must be a physical thing, because a physical kingdom was promised in the Old Testament. Let's look at some examples. Psalm 89. You have said, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Okay, there's another one in Jeremiah 33, beginning in verse 19. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, thus says the Lord. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David my servant may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne, and my covenant with the Levitical priests my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David my servant and the Levitical priests who minister to me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed that these people are saying, The Lord has rejected the two clans that he chose? Thus they have despised my people, so that they are no longer a nation in their sight. Thus says the Lord, If I have not established my covenant with day and night, and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. We're talking about David and his descendants and the throne in Jerusalem. This, this does sound pretty physical. God is saying, there is no possible chance that I'm going to reject the covenant that I made with them. In Ezekiel, we see the same story. Ezekiel chapter 37. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, and will gather them from all around, and bring them to their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all, and they shall no longer be two nations, and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, and their detestable things, or with any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all the backslidings in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever, and David my servant shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will set them in their land and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. And these are just a couple of examples. There are so many more passages in the Old Testament that make broadly the same points. So in the view of the, essentially the premillennialist, a spiritual kingdom just isn't enough to fulfill these prophecies that put such a focus on God's dwelling place being with man and the land, the land for goodness sakes, and drawing all the Israelites out of the nations and, and to their ancestral homeland that he had set apart for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. But there's a, a really big problem with this interpretation. Turn to John chapter 6. Here, during Jesus' ministry, even relatively early on in Jesus' ministry, he was working amazing signs and wonders, and he had a lot of people following him around in Galilee. One of these particular signs was when he fed a crowd of 5,000 people, starting with, for all intents and purposes, no food. And we read in verses 14 and 15, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He rejected the attempt to make him a physical king. If a physical kingdom was the plan all along, then why would he withdraw? Okay, there are some possible objections or, I suppose, answers to this question. First of all, we would say maybe it just wasn't time yet. But if a physical kingdom was the goal, what was left for him to do? He'd already shown his power. He'd already shown his compassion. He'd already demonstrated who he was and from where he came. If he was just here to establish the physical kingdom, why wouldn't this be the right time? 
Now, maybe someone would say, yeah, but this was up in Galilee with a relatively small number of people, just a few thousand. And the whole nation needed to accept Jesus, not just, you know, a, a paltry few. Okay. How did David become king? Do you, do you remember that? He was anointed at God's direction in 1 Samuel 16. He had zero followers at that point. Significantly later in 2 Samuel 2, the tribe of Judah made him king over them. Just, just the one tribe. And it wasn't until seven years later in chapter 5 of 2 Samuel that the rest of Israel made him king. So, given that we're talking about the promised son of David who is supposed to sit on David's throne and reign forever, the objection that it was just too few people and that the whole nation as, as a group needed to accept him at once, it just doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. But neither of these is really the, the kicker. That comes in John chapter 18. Let's read beginning in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. It's really tough, first of all, to reconcile what Jesus says about his spiritual kingdom with the premillennialist position that it's a, a physical kingdom. But that's really not even the crucial bit. For our purposes today, the crucial bit is what we read in verses 37 and 38. When Jesus said, I came to bear witness to the truth, and Pilate responds, what is truth? Where did that come from? How is Christ's spiritual kingship tied to the truth? Why did he bring that into the conversation so abruptly, and then why is it left off so abruptly without really fully exploring that, that question, what is truth? Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, we just read late in the last chapter that he doesn't take Jesus' claim to be a king at all seriously, and yet he's labeling Jesus King of the Jews on his cross. Why would he do this? Well, typically, you would put a sign over the cross with somebody on it being executed that had a, a label which consisted of the offense they had committed that led to this execution, which is to say, this man is a murderer, this man is an insurrectionist, that's why they're being executed. So if you don't want to end up like this, then don't be what this sign says. But now what Pilate has done is he has labeled Jesus' offense being king of the Jews, which he doesn't take seriously in the first place. He's making fun, not of Jesus, but of the Jewish leaders that turned Jesus over to him. Verses 20 through 22 make this pretty clear. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. He's making fun of them. He doesn't take Jesus seriously, he doesn't see that Jesus is a threat, and he doesn't see why these Jewish authorities should feel threatened either. Jesus, in Pilate's book, is a harmless kook with some weird ideas and no intention whatsoever of leading a rebellion against Caesar. That's what Pilate thinks. But what was the truth? He was, and is, a king. Just not in the physical way that Pilate had expected. To Pilate, a spiritual kingdom didn't really deserve the name, so he finds no reason to condemn Jesus. But as Pilate asks, what is truth? Is a true kingdom a physical one or a spiritual one? The root of the doctrinal fallacy involved with the premillennialist doctrine, and plenty of others, is thinking that 
this around us is reality, and that the spiritual is somehow less real, or perhaps not real at all. This misconception shows up in, in those teachings, how much worse when it shows up in our lives. The author of the book of Hebrews covers this problem in great detail. There's a problem that the author of Hebrews is trying to address, and we could simply describe it as stagnation among the Hebrew Christians at the time he was writing. The first three chapters, or two and a half, I suppose, the author goes to great lengths to detail the fact that God's Son is better than what they had in the past. He's better than the earthly covenant. His message is better, his salvation is better, and even he himself, the messenger, is better. The latter part of chapter 3, going through most of chapter 4, details that the, the rest we anticipate is better than the rest that the Jews had to look forward to. They were looking for rest from their labors in a homeland that God had prepared across the Jordan River. And then they found it, and you know, it wasn't everything it was cracked up to be. But we get to cross a river into something that is a much more genuine and real rest. The end of chapter 4 and going down to about chapter 8 details that our high priest is far superior than the Levitical high priesthood. In chapter 9, we learn that the holy place in the temple is better now than it was under the Jewish covenant. How can that be given that we don't have a physical temple? Let's pick up in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Does it sound like the physical or the spiritual is more real here? We could go on for the sake of time, we won't get into it, but uh, basically the rest of chapter 9, and even I guess I would like to read the first verse of chapter 10, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities... It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. The idea here is that the, the physical under the law of Moses was less real than the spiritual that we now see today. Chapters 10 through 12 are about how we can't see these things outright, but we have our faith as the assurance of what is real and what is true. And he wraps this all up in chapter 12, beginning in verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. So, if the truth is not just what you can see, but something much greater, how should you live? You should live according to the Spirit. Which, by the way, is how the author of Hebrews fills up chapter 13. Why would you live your life as if the physical is real and the spiritual is fake? Ask yourself throughout the week, when you make decisions, even little decisions, 
Is this a decision based on what's fake or what's real? Is this for the best interests of Christ's real spiritual kingdom or my own temporary and in some sense fake physical one? Is this for a temporary goal or for an eternal one? Ask yourself more often, not in the jaded cynical way that Pilate did, but in reality, ask yourself, what is truth? If you find yourself living in the physical, you're making a big mistake. Obviously, this doesn't mean that we should stop managing the physical things in our lives. You can see an instance where that happened among Christians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and Paul says, no, cut that out. But don't let the physical become your sum total of reality. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Is a spiritual kingdom enough to fulfill all those prophecies? No, the spiritual fulfillments are not a cop-out because the physical was too far out of reach. They are better than the physical. Much better. We ought to ask instead, would a physical kingdom have been enough to fulfill all of these prophecies? No, well, clearly it wasn't. Jesus was given the opportunity to reign over a physical kingdom, and he rejected it. A physical kingdom isn't as real as a spiritual one. The physical is here for a while, but it passes away and is forgotten, becomes nothing but a memory and a record in the history books. It is lifeless and useless and meaningless and gutless. The things that men work for all their lives pass away, and so do the men themselves. But the spirit lasts. Pilate looked at Jesus' claim to be a king as if the kingdom was a figment of Jesus' imagination. From the opposite perspective, the whole universe is sort of a figment of God's imagination, isn't it? It's just hard for us to see it that way because it's all that we have ever experienced. How blessed are we, though, to be given the knowledge, even such a, a tiny slice of it, the knowledge of the things that are real, the things that transcend this physical world. How blessed are we to have the opportunity to live according to those things in a spiritual kingdom that, unlike the kingdoms of this earth, cannot be shaken. Live your life according to the truth. Walk by the Spirit. If you're not doing that, if you're not walking by faith in step with the Spirit, then you're not a part of the kingdom Christ established. We'd love to help you change that at River Ridge. The gates to the city are open. He's ready for you to join. You can reach out to us at 812-550-6234 or info at riverridgechurch.org. We'd love to help, and we'd love to have you as fellow subjects of the benevolent monarch who rules even now from Mount Zion. Not, not the Temple Mount with the big mosque on it, but the real one the one that God established to be his son's throne. If you'd like to join us, you can find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh. We gather at 9 a.m. on Sundays for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, 4 p.m. for afternoon worship, and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays for another study. I hope to see you there. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.